Tonight, the remarkable story of a Welshman who helped change the face of rock music. He was a key member of the biggest band on the planet. They've sold over 100 million albums worldwide. And for Roger Glover of Deep Purple, it all started on a small farm near Llangorse in the Brecon Beacons. Purple have just completed a sellout European tour. With exclusive access to the legendary band, we bring you the story of how Roger Glover almost lost his sanity during four decades of sex, booze, and rock and roll. Oh, I'm gonna say yet <laughs> again, yet again. I found myself getting quite clogged up. It's absolutely beautiful, and the beauty of it was not something I noticed as a kid. So as a kid, I don't think you know what beauty is, you know. I'm looking around and going, well, this is where I'm from. You know, it's really come home to me that, that this is... These, these hills, these valleys, this, these farms, these trees, these sheep. <laughs> it's... it's brings back so many memories of my youth that it really brings it home that I am Welsh. Roger Glover was born on a farm near Llangors in the Brecon Beacons. His first steps in music came when he helped an elderly neighbour do her shopping. Yes. She said when he comes back he's always at the piano. Why don't you let him, me take lessons for him? I said do what you like Joan, I don't mind what you do. That's where it all started I suppose. As his interest in music grew, his mother began to worry about his other schoolwork, so hired a private tutor for him. It was a mansion. I said, do you think you could take Roger in extra lessons? And she said, yes, she would, which she did. And then she came down one night. She said, oh, well, I shouldn't take the money tonight because, to tell you the truth, we haven't done any work. I've had a long talk with Roger, and I don't know what he's going to do in life, but all I can tell you, he's above average intelligence, and one day he's going to become something great. The family moved to London, where the young Welsh boy was soon embroiled in the rock and roll revolution. It really took over my life, music. But only as a fan. I never thought I'd ever be a musician. I thought it was too far down the road, you know. Until I got my first guitar, and that confirmed that I'd never be a musician, because it was just too difficult. He formed his first band while still in school, and wrote his first song when he was just 13. Ding, 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 sit and cry, ding, 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 I'm crying over you. Sit and cry, ding, 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 that's what you drove me to. Very redolent of its time. But, you know, I played it to Ian Gillan once. He said, it's great, I love it. We should do it in Deep Purple. I said, why? He said, he said because it's memorable. By 65, Roger was touring with Chart Hopeful's Episode 6. Ian Gillan was the front man. He saw me as a, a something of a... Philistine, I think, um, a heathen, um, a creative non-entity, um, which is entirely true. That's exactly how I was. I came in, I was more interested in, well, I was just interested in being a thug, really. <laughs> Glover, in contrast, was quiet and thoughtful. Together, they became a formidable songwriting partnership. I turned professional by going to Germany with episode six and working in one of those sweatshops clubs just like the Beatles did in Hamburg we did it in Frankfurt I know it was grunt work you know it wasn't stardom it was just grunt work it was rough in it no money sleeping in the van a lot of the time as episode six struggled to break into the charts in Europe across the Atlantic a band called Deep Purple had a smash hit by 69 Purple were looking for a new singer and asked Gillen to audition we were so broke we only had one set of what you might call clothes that could be seen in public to share between us. So if he wanted to go out somewhere and 
you know, he'd borrow my trousers. Or, and if I wanted to go out somewhere, I'd borrow his shirt, because he had one good shirt and I had one decent pair of trousers. And so uh, when we joined Purple, um, I said, look, we've got a session. I need to wear the, the clothes. <laughs> and uh, so I went along with the uh, set of outfits. At the last minute, they said, well, we need a bass player as well. Do you need any bass players? So I said, yeah, Roger Glover. He's great. So he said, fine, he came along, he said, but you've got the clothes. He said, I can't be seen out. <laughs> I had frayed trousers, no socks. I, I actually had string holding my trousers up. So I must have made a pretty good impression. And my impression of them was, in fact, they were all wearing new clothes. When, when we first saw Roger, we were slightly uh, incredulous. There's a guy there with his trousers held up with string, uh, living the hippie dream. He hasn't changed much in 30 years. <laughs> they were the big boys. They were the pros. They were great musicians. And I was really a bit out of my depth as a bass player. With Roger, what you get is not what you see. There's a lot, a lot more to him than on the surface. And it was very, uh, it was very apparent earlier on that uh, he had a lot to offer us. At the end of the session, John Lord came to me and said, well, we've had a chat, me and the boys, and uh, we'd like to join our band. And I said, well, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, I couldn't leave episode six. He, you know, Ian, he's leaving. If I leave as well, this, you know, we've been through so much together, I can't just leave. Um, and he was a bit taken aback at that, and he said, we'll give you 25 pounds a week. <laughs> I said, sorry, you know, I just can't leave my mates, you know. We came from school together, we were th thick and thin, as it were. But overnight, I couldn't sleep that night, and I thought, episode six is really, you know, we've tried hard all these years, and we haven't clicked it. Maybe this is just too good an opportunity to miss. So I called him up at 9 o'clock the next morning and said, hey, it's me. He went, who? I said, Roger. I said, Roger who? I said, Roger, the bass player from last night. Oh, call me back after three. Click. <laughs> of course, that rock and roll lifestyle I didn't know about then, but <clears throat> so I thought I'd blown it. So I called him back, and, and uh, so I joined Deep Purple. It wasn't long before Roger Glover was making musical history. I mean, I'd been in the band weeks, just barely weeks before we were at the Albert Hall playing with an orchestra. Totally out of my depth, you know, praying that I wouldn't make a mistake. <laughs> It was baptism of fire, I suppose, really. It was, um... I was too busy to really take it in at the time. Just looking back at it, you go, wow, I actually did that. I actually did it. The concerto gave Glover his first taste of fame, but the band weren't happy with the image they'd gained as orchestral rockers, and so decided to set the record straight. They set up their gear in a dingy hall and began jamming. And I know I did it, I just started playing this riff. I just, I'd never thought about it. It wasn't anything that came from any kind of conscious part of my brain. I just started playing down, ding, down, 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 ding, ding, ding. That riff became Speed King, a song that was rockier and louder than anything that had come before. It revolutionized the rock world. And it's still a crowd favourite today. <laughs> but their record company wanted a chart hit. They were given 24 hours to write and record it. I think there was a point where we just gave up and thought, we'll just, just go to the pub and drink lots of beer. By 10.30, we were scatterbrained and... Richie and I walked back first for some reason, went in the studio and he picked up the guitar and he started playing that riff. And I said something along the lines of, that's good, let's do that. And he said, no, it's, it's, uh, it's Ricky Nelson's version of Summertime. I was just playing. I said, well, I've never heard that. Let's do it. <laughs> Recorded as a drunken joke, Black Knight was a runaway success. 
my life did change. There was more money. I bought. I went from a Mini to an MGB to an Aston Martin in the space of about 12 months. Um, Aston Martin DB6 with Vantage engine, just like James Bond. Um, I still wore denim. Uh, one of my lovely moments that I like to remember is outside the, the band offices in, in London, in Newman Street. My car was parked and uh, I went to get in it and a policeman came in and said, uh, excuse me, so this is your vehicle. And obviously I must have looked suspicious to him, you know, denim hat and patches and things getting into this Aston Martin. And uh, I said, uh, yeah. He said, can you prove that, sir? <laughs> Of course, I, uh, yes, yeah. Success followed success with chart-topping singles and albums. And I suppose that the rock star life did happen, you know. We, were, we used to drink a lot. There were a lot of girls around, parties. I, I experienced that life that people think of as legendary. And it was a kind of crazy time. I mean, it, it all kind of, I don't remember a lot of it, funnily enough. It all becomes a blur. It took me years, years, really, to look back and realize how big a band we were. I had no idea, really, that we were that big at the time. It all seemed so real. You know, in a hotel room, in a car, in a stage. Oh, 10,000 people out there. I just took it for granted, in a way. Newspapers called it Purple Mania, but it was only when Glover met some fans face to face that he realized how big they'd become. So I finished the soundtrack and I went over and sat down on the edge of the stage and signing, you know, hey, Dan, what are you doing here? What are you studying? You know, just chatting away. And there was one guy at the back that didn't say a word, and I sort of gradually became aware of him. He had tears in his eyes. And I finally said, you OK, mate? You all right? And he said, oh, he said, you're the most famous person I've ever met. And to me, I th but I'm just, I'm from Flangorse, you know. <laughs> I'm a Welsh boy, born on a farm, you know. How can you say that? Um, and of course, it, it, I don't know, I never thought about it, but I suppose it did sink in then. I said, I'm a star. Deep Purple still had greater heights to scale, but the higher they climbed, the further they were destined to fall. <laughs> 